Good morning, good morning. Hey, y'all. Welcome to the Springs. So excited to be with you guys. Thank y'all for making your way towards a seat. Our seating is a little confusing today, but it's because we are currently under some renovations. But man, we're really glad you guys are here. So excited to be with you guys. I want to start out our time, though, by sharing a story about something I used to own, I used to possess, I no longer do, and I really wish I did. Anybody have anything? And this isn't even like a, like a, a Christian judo trick shot at like materialism, right? There's no trap in this. Anybody have something you used to own? You got rid of it, you sold it, it broke, whatever it might be. And you just look back and you're like, I should have never gotten rid of that. Maybe a car, a boat, usually has to do something like that. Kind of like something that represents a lifestyle. Okay, okay. Here, here was mine because I want to show it to you guys. I used to be so, so much cooler than what I am, all right? <laughs> and I'm not even saying I was cool back then, but I was definitely cooler than I am today. I used to own a motorcycle. Yes. We have a photo. Oh, yeah. Okay. I, hold on. Keep it there. I wanted to see it. Okay. This matters. Out of those three, right, you've got kind of like, okay, to the right, to the left, to the middle. Which one of those do y'all think was mine? Dude, straight Mad Max looking right in the middle. I loved it. It was so much fun. I had a blast on it. I loved it. I sold it. Why? I'm an idiot. I'm dumb. There were more reasons than that that we'll talk about, but I sold it. Man, I, I literally, I can remember. Why did I buy a motorcycle? I could. It was totally against my parents' counsel, but I was out of college. I was on my own. I was paying for it with my own money. Living by myself, had a one-bedroom apartment. I knew where I would park it. Literally, a buddy of mine was into motorcycles. He gave me a tutori uh, tutorial in a parking lot about basically how to like, get it out of first where you just work the clutch. Literally, I never even had ridden a motorcycle down a street before I bought a motorcycle. I was literally, my job, I would travel. I was on a plane coming back from Atlanta for a work project I was on. Before I left the plane, I checked the Dallas. I lived in Dallas, Dallas Craigslist in the surrounding region for motorcycles. I saw one, I sent it to my buddy, and I said, hey man, if you like this, because he was into motorcycles, he actually knew what he was doing, right? If you like this, I'll buy it. You, you decide, I'm getting on a plane, if you like it, I'll buy it, right? I fly, by the time I landed in Dallas, I have a text message that says, hey, we're going to get it tonight. <laughs> it was awesome. We literally come, I, I didn't know how to ride it. I didn't know how to do anything on it. My buddy had to like test ride it, and then he had to like put it up into the back of a pickup. We'd driven like two hours outside of Dallas, picked it up, came all the way back. I had to get it repaired, had to get it fixed, had to go to one of those um, safety motorcycle schools just so I could learn how to ride the thing that I now owned, put insurance on it. I loved it. Why do y'all think I currently don't have a motorcycle? Okay, kids. Kid, my wife is like, yes, yes, maturity, responsibility, okay, don't be selfish, John. <laughs> that's exactly right. <laughs> like, that's exactly right. Like, even in marriage, because I went and I sold it, there was a time, I think we were getting a house or something like that, but I made a dumb financial decision, but also it was like, okay, I'm married now. My wife, she didn't really want to go ride on it, Right? I had a kiddo on the way. My life had changed, where all of a sudden, I started to realize I would get on my motorcycle, and it was very different. Back then, I had a pickup truck than when I would get in my pickup truck. See, I'd get in my pickup truck, I'd put my seatbelt on, I'd start the car, and I'd just drive. I would get on the motorcycle, and I would start the motorcycle, and I would pray. <laughs> Literally, every time, I'd pray for safety. And I can remember thinking, like, I don't do this in the pickup. <laughs> My life had changed. Now, I have since looked, even in marriage, at getting a motorcycle. Right now, that is not the right play. I've completely laid it aside, and I promised I would never bring it up again. Mm, yeah. uh, hint. Uh, but here's the reason I want to share it. When I got married, life totally changed. Life totally changed. 
Responsibilities totally changed. Obligations totally changed. What I used to get to do, some of it, not all of it, I can no longer do it in the same way. Don't get me wrong. I love marriage. Marriage is amazing. But what I want to start out by saying is there are some total perks to singleness. Some of y'all, the application out of this is you're going to go buy something. (laughs) Why? Because you can. Okay? And others of you, you're going to go have a midlife crisis wishing you had a motorcycle. But here's where I want to start out by talking about this. Today, Jesus is going to teach you and me about singleness. Singleness. See, is I share singleness, especially in, in like a, a church crowd. And what I mean by that is like, if you're here and you're a follower of Jesus or like you grew up in church or you're watching online and you're familiar with this, singleness, I think to many church folk, it's kind of a dirty word. It's like a negative word. Where we come, and of course, like through high school, you're single, college, you're single, but after that, like time starts ticking by. And we can almost tend to have a very negative view of singleness. We can look down on it, and not just for reasons of like, hey, you can buy a motorcycle or you can't. That's silly. But it can almost come like, okay, well, if you're single, maybe, maybe there's something wrong with you. And singleness is something that doesn't just impact people prior to marriage. Singleness can be real for those who've lost a spouse and are widowed. To those who've lost a spouse and are divorced. The question is, we can all come this morning and we think about singleness. Like some of you, you are single and you are here and you are ready to mingle. Bless you. I think local church is one of the best places on the planet to swipe right. (laughs) Or left. I think right is good. I'm not sure. I'm out of the game, all that. But one of the things that I really want to do today is I want to show you how Jesus gives tremendous dignity to singleness. Some of you, as I say that, whether widowed, divorced, or just single, though, it doesn't feel like dignity. It feels like a curse. It feels like you are the perpetual fifth wheel. Or perhaps you are the parent who looks at a kiddo, and the primary thing that you think about for your kiddo is when will they get married, who will they get married, and you just put this pressure on them that Jesus never did. You know what Jesus calls people to be? Faithful. You can be faithful in marriage. You can be faithful in singleness. What we're going to talk about today is the beauty of singleness, because here here at Springs Community Church, here's what I'm really going to ask on behalf of our our church family, our members, right? So if you're not a part of this family, I still think you should do it. But if you are, man, I think this matters. Singleness will never be viewed as the lesser here. Here's why. You totally can be single and be dysfunctional. And I know y'all. I know me. There's some single folks here who have some stuff. And you can totally be married and have dysfunction. The idea that the grass is greener, no, 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 no. Dwell in the land and cultivate faithfulness. Grass is green where you water it. Desiring marriage, beautiful, righteous, totally biblical. He who finds a wife finds a good thing. Marriage is wonderful. Desire for marriage is wonderful. But discontentment without it, feeling the lesser until you get it, wrong. And that's something I think the American church, myself at times, we can get it twisted. Jesus never did. That's why I'm so excited to spend our time talking about the beauty of singleness. We're going to be in Matthew 19. That's where we were last week, is we had this like super uplifting and happy talk about marriage and divorce. It was amazing. And this week, it's fascinating. Jesus, he's going to continue, and he's going to go from marriage, divorce, then he's going to talk about singleness. What's his view of singleness? How do you and I perhaps steward singleness? And then at the end, he's going to talk about kids. It'll be interesting. Why does he start talking about kids? 
So if you have a Bible, turn with me. Matthew chapter 19, and we're going to read verses 10 through 15. Again, to recap last week, though. Last week, Jesus presented as he's trying to be tricked and trapped. You can't really trick him. He's God, right? As as they're attempting to trick him. He talked about the beauty of marriage. But inside the beauty of marriage, he talked about two things. One, it's beauty, it's oneness, it's magnificence. Marriage is a wonderful thing. You do not have to settle for a bad marriage. That's not the Holy Spirit's intent for you. If you're a follower of his, he wants you to have the best marriage on the planet, and there's a way to do it. But the second thing with the beauty of marriage that he taught us about is he talked about the severity of the marriage commitment. How it's a relationship that's unlike any other. He talked about the beauty of marriage, and this week he's going to talk about the beauty of singleness. So I'm going to read verses 10 through 15, but you have to remember again the context. He's just engaged with the Pharisees. They've asked him about divorce. He's taught on marriage, and then he's just come, and he's taught on adultery. And then he gets away, and it's just him and his disciples. And his disciples, in response to hearing about the severity of a marriage covenant and commitment, this is how they pick it up in 10, and I'll read 10 through 15, and then we'll talk our way through it. Verse 10 The disciples said to him, being Jesus, if such is the case of a man with his wife, like, hey, Jesus, if marriage is such a serious commitment, if such is the case of the man with his wife, it's better not to marry. If you remember the context, Jewish first century culture, divorce was commonplace. You could divorce for anything you want. It was no-fault divorce on steroids. Turn the volume all the way up. We already exist in a divorce culture. Jesus totally knew, so did they. The disciples said to him, if such is the case of a man with his wife, it's better not to marry. Jesus said to them, fascinating. Not everyone can receive this saying, but only those to whom it is given. And this is where Jesus is going to uphold singleness. For there are eunuchs who have been so from birth. There are eunuchs who have been made eunuchs by men. And there are eunuchs who have made themselves eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom. Let the one who is able to receive this receive it. He starts it with, if you can receive this, it's been given. And then he ends it with, let the one who can receive this receive it. And then he comes in and all of a sudden kids show up. 13 through 15. Then children were brought to him that he might lay his hands on them and pray. That was commonplace. Rabbis would bless children. But the disciples rebuked the people. The people there are probably their parents. Parents bringing kids for blessing by Christ. But Jesus said, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them. For to such belongs the kingdom of heaven. He laid his hands on them and went away. So there's a lot of things in here that we're going to spend our time walking through and unpacking. But the broad picture that you need to see, it's in contrast to the beauty of marriage. Christ is going to uphold the beauty, the dignity, and the opportunity of singleness. Here's why this was scandalous. To be single then was almost a mark of shame. The epitome would have been marriage, and then from that, continuing a generation, a progeny, physical children. And right here, in a culture where it was, no, man, I got to do all I can to be married so I could have status, so I could not be viewed by society as the lesser. Jesus says, hey, you know what a great alternative is to marriage? You know what another option is to marriage that everybody else overlooks, everybody else undermines, everybody else looks down on in shame? Singleness. Singleness. In a culture that brought hate to it, Jesus gives honor, dignity, and beauty. Now, I'm not saying American culture or even like church culture brings hate and dishonor to singleness. I personally think like secular culture, like like if you don't believe in Jesus, like that view of singleness is oftentimes more biblical than the American church's cultural view of singleness. 
Here's what I mean by that. That view of singleness is totally flawed, where it says, you got one life. Go all in. Enjoy it. That results in, like, sinful hedonism. That's wrong. But the American church, we come and we approach singleness like, oh, oh, you're, you're JV. Don't worry. We'll pray for you one day. Where what is the Bible screaming its singleness? It's saying, no, 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 no. You got one life, and then you live for an eternity. You go all in. You don't waste a day. You're not less than. You're chosen. You're loved. You're beloved. You're an heir. You're adopted. You got gifts. You got talents. Go. See, culture misses it, and it gets it right in some ways, but the church has missed it, and we, by the power of God's Spirit, we want to get it right. But working through this passage, the first thing that happens is in context, the disciples come and say, hey, if that's the stance of marriage, and any time you talk about marriage or divorce, which we're not going to break down today, it has a tendency to just bring shame to people. Jesus Christ came to die for every ounce of shame in my life and in yours. The one who died for your shame cannot heap shame on you. He takes shame from you and dies for it. He loves you. And Christians or church folk that come and heap shame, woe to us. But the disciples do come, and they're like, whoa, if that's the stance on marriage, it's better that we not marry. That leaves singleness, which to them really would have been the lesser. And Jesus is like, you got it. Ding, 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 right answer. Disciples often don't have the right answer, but they got it. And then he says, whoever can receive this, it's been given. The first thing that really comes, though, that I do think the American church, disciples of Christ, have to consider Marriage is a weighty commitment. The disciples understood that. Like, if you want to see the beauty of singleness, you do need to disciple yourself in the role of marriage. See, we come, and we talked a little bit more about this last week, so if you want more, go, go listen to it. We can make marriage like an idol, like, okay, once I get there, you complete me. I'm now varsity status, and now someone will be sleeping in the same bed as me. I'll get to be intimate, so I'll never again wrestle with lust. That's a lie. Like, I'll have companionship, so I'll never feel lonely. That's a lie. But we make it like, okay, I finally arrived. It's not true. A righteous understanding of marriage says, okay, marriage is a covenant for better, for worse, where a Christian spouse looks at a Christian spouse and says, I will love you no matter what. That's a weighty commitment. Many of us, as we enter into that, we don't even fully understand that's what's at stake, but we know it because we have the scars on the backside. What I do think is true is followers of Christ in singleness, you need to understand the role of marriage. It's beautiful, but it's far more about your holiness than your happiness. But will you have some amazingly happy times? Yes. This is part of the reason why whenever couples come and I have the chance to like officiate a wedding, I'll sit down, right, where I feel a sense of freedom. I'll sit down with those couples and I'm a huge buzzkill. Huge buzzkill. Because the first thing that I'll say, like if I know them or I clarify faith, all that kind of stuff, I'll sit there and I'll say, okay, okay, I, I hear you. It's such an honor, all that. Let me ask you, why do you want to get married? You hear the heart, he's amazing, she completes me, all that. You talk about it. And then you ask, and this is where, like, people don't like hanging out with me that much, and I, I get it. <laughs> okay. What would it take for you to feel free to get a divorce? What would it take? And you have them start to build out a theology of marriage. And, and basically, when I look at folks, I say, okay. Whatever that is, if it's different than what the vows that we all love resonating with, you just got to put it in the vows. 
Now, as I share that, folks have had their vows betrayed. Folks here have broken their vows. There is a God in heaven who loves you, who can redeem anything. There's no shame on you. Christ has died for you. But there is a way when you walk in it that he pleads with you, it'll go well with you. But do you see how there is something for us to consider about the marriage relationship, for parents to instruct in the beauty of marriage, as well as the responsibility of it? The disciples got that. But knowing they got that, that's where Jesus comes, and then he elevates. What else should we do in singleness? You understand marriage. He elevates the dignity of singleness, the opportunity of singleness. And you got to remember, right? Like, Like picture you go to like some... Uh, southern, southern college where you go there and whether or not you mean to or not, you have this implicit pressure to get like an MRS degree or maybe like an MR degree. I'm trying to be gender equal opportunity attackist, but I don't know how to do that, right? Right? But a Mr. degree or Mrs. degree, and you don't even mean to, right? But the whole, whole school, the whole culture, it's like ring by spring, and it's not just you get that Aggie ring, but like you get that wedding ring, and then you can take all those Instagram photos, like your hands are just perfectly posed, and you're just waiting the whole time, and every nice young man, every nice young woman you meet, your first question is like, I wonder if they'll be my wife. I wonder if they'll be my husband. When we talk about the value and the dignity of singleness, You have to start by fighting this tendency of, I'll finally have arrived. I'll finally have arrived. That was absolutely how first century Jews would have felt. It's how many of us feel today, have felt in the past, where Jesus comes into a culture with an absurdly high view of marriage, says, you can be amazing in singleness. You can be faithful in marriage, You can be faithful in singleness. You can be faithless in marriage. You can be faithless in singleness. And then Jesus gives three interesting categories about singleness where he starts talking about eunuchs. You want to talk about eunuchs with me for a little bit? I loved getting to study this 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 week, by the way. First thing he comes, he gives three categories. Eunuchs who have been so from birth. Eunuchs who have been made eunuchs by man. And then eunuchs who have chosen to be eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom. There's two categories of eunuchs here. There's the unchosen eunuch and then the chosen eunuch, right? First category where he comes and he presents eunuchs who have been so from birth. Jewish culture, what Jesus is likely speaking to here is people who are infertile, infertile. There was a huge responsibility. That's why male heirs being able to pass down a name and a legacy, huge responsibility for that. Because the book of Matthew is written to Jews, many scholars think Jesus right here, he's actually referencing Isaiah 53. In Isaiah 53, it's talking about how a Savior and a Messiah will come. And the Savior and Messiah will come to heal, to save, and to bring hope to the hopeless. And one of the hopeless in Isaiah 53 that's held out is an infertile eunuch. Because at that time, they were saying, how else does my family name continue? If my family name can't continue, I have no value. And literally, Old Testament prophecy, the Messiah coming and saying, no, 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 no. God in heaven will give you an everlasting name. You don't need to have a biological family. You're in his family. So because The Gospel of Matthew and Jesus here, he's just engaged with Pharisees right here. They think, Jesus, he's alluding to this prophecy. One thing that's also true about this verse is it's come under a lot of thoughtful discussion in the past five, ten years, and arguably a little bit before, but not much further. We're right here where it talks about eunuchs who have been so from birth. Some folks will come and they'll talk about what this does is this introduces intersex. There's male, there's female, and there's intersex. Where in this moment is Jesus perhaps introducing a new third gender? And then from a third, some of y'all are nodding your head and some of y'all are like, why intersex? What are we talking about? Just turn on the news, it'll be fine. Third gender of intersex. And then from a third gender, perhaps like a gender fluidity, like a non-binary where there's male, there's female, which is predominantly defined by cultural femininity or cultural masculinity. And then within there, 
You choose. You decide. Who do you want to be? Just a few thoughts on how that's not what Jesus is doing here. One, we, we know from this passage where he introduces eunuchs from birth, it's likely referencing to infertile. But infertile would have been assigned biological sex and gender. Male. The same thing is going to be happened with eunuchs who have been made so by men. In order for something to be taken away, which is going to be castration, right? There had to be a presenting genitalia. The second thing that we know why Jesus, he's not introducing here a gender fluidity, is if you read this passage in context, and Jesus taught all of this in context, five verses ago, he took them back to the garden where he said, male and female, he created them. But here's the third thing. The third thing. The American church can err in two ways. There are two genders designed by God with beauty and dignity. But what can happen is we can come, and even though we don't want the shame from our past divorce, we don't want the shame from our present marriage that's struggling, we don't want the shame from us wishing we were married but wrestling with porn, masturbation while single, we don't want the shame of others coming and saying that your season of life, you just wish you could be in the next season, or man, you wish you could go back to when you were single. We don't want that shame, but man, will we sure come and heap shame on others. He died for all of the baggageness and all of the brokenness. The other thing that's also true, you get that? Christ is anti-shame, pro-redemption. That doesn't mean you ever water down truth. But don't you be a bully. He died for bullies. And he died for the bullied. People just like me. People just like you. The second category of eunuch that he talks about is eunuchs that have been made so by men. This one, who. The 21st century, this would be a really tough job description. I don't know how much you'd have to pay somebody to come and take this job, right? But here's what this was likely. A servant or a slave born as property that was likely going to tend to a harem. The vast majority of this was male. Vast majority. Where at birth, they were castrated. And then put in the care of a harem of women, group of females, that's the second category. Where Jesus right here is he's alluding to people who in this culture, who there's no wife that's going to choose them. There's no wife that's going to want them. And he's saying, they will mock you. They won't want you. I will love you. I will make you in my family. You do not exist just waiting to die. You can be mine. I can use you. You have dignity. You have value. Y'all track with that? Third category is he comes and he talks about those who have chosen to be eunuchs. Why? And this so matters. For the sake of the kingdom. I had a, a friend of mine. He, he, great. He's pastored, led a ton of singles literally across the country. He has this line where he says, um, I can tell if you have the gift of singleness. You guys may have wondered, have you ever had the gift of singleness? Do you have the gift of singleness? That is something I can remember wondering, thinking about, praying through, all that kind of stuff. I'd become a Christian. I was single. I didn't know, hey, God, what does that mean? What does it look like? Does it mean like celibacy is the path? Do I not really care? What if I still have lust? What if I don't? It could be a weird thing in church circles. I loved his clarity, though. He said, hey, I have the ability to decide, to discern, to determine if you have the gift of singleness in one question. And his question was, are you single? Are you single? If yes, you have the gift of singleness. You have the gift of singleness. Now, you can receive a gift but wish you didn't have it. You can be in possession of something and wish you had something else. 
This happens all the time to followers of Jesus, where we endure a sense of, God, you have brought something to me. It hurts. It takes. I don't want it. Please change it. Your Bible is full of a righteous path of suffering where you receive something you don't want. But singleness is meant to be something where Jesus, he's contrasting it to marriage. He's giving it dignity. He's giving it beauty. He's giving it value. But here's the real trick. If you're a follower of Jesus, if you're not a follower of Jesus, yeah, yeah, yeah. YOLO, you do you. Been there. I bought the t-shirt, man. You'll end up with scars. When I think about my personal life, there's a season of life where I hands down carry the most regret as well as some of the most joy. Singleness. People who say they don't have regrets, I call them liars, all right? From my season of singleness, I carry hands down the most regret of my life. That regret has been paid for. I am free. I'm loved. I'm cherished. I'm chosen. Before God, because of Christ, I am a rock star. I'm so loved. It's not special to me. If you believe in him, you can have it too. But I had a ton of regret. And then by the grace of God, and it wasn't because I knew any different, but I was discipled and I was shown singleness can be amazing. What does it hinge on? Do you view your singleness as for the sake of the kingdom? That's the one that Jesus talks about here. That's the eunuch. It's the chosen eunuch. It's not a mutilated, it's not castrated. It's the chosen eunuch. But they choose it not because I don't have any better options. Because no one really loves me. Because I feel like God has overlooked me. Because I wonder if anyone really even cares. That's not the eunuch he's talking about. The eunuch he talks about says, no, no, I'm going to take this time and this season of singleness and I'm going to do something with it. There's purpose in it. I'm not going to waste a moment. Your Bible has a principle for all Christians. Make the best use of the time. For the days are evil. Teach me to number my days. Your Bible is full of how Christians should view time. Time is opportunity. How do people people spell love? T-I-M-E. Use that time for the sake of the kingdom. But if you use it for your kingdom's sake, which Christians, we would like never publicly say it that way, but that's how we live. Like, no, no, I've made myself a eunuch for my sake, and I'm really hoping my status can go to single, to complicated, to engaged, to married real soon. Or if we step in and we say, okay, God, I believe you give good things. I believe you love me. I believe you are in control. I believe you have not forgotten me. I believe you have purpose and dignity for, more, for my life. Let's go to work. Here's how the church, followers of Jesus, should steward singleness. Here's just a couple that I wrote down and thought of. One, when you're single, how should you steward it? If you're a follower of Jesus, if you're not a follower of Jesus, yeah, YOLO, you do you, call us, we'll be there to pick up all the mess. It's going to hurt you, though. First thing, learn your Bible. If you're single, learn your Bible. If you are in high school, learn your Bible. It is through learning Scripture where you will see, he loves me. I have dignity. My suffering can produce beauty And even when I don't understand it, I'm going to plead by the power of the Holy Spirit to cling to him, knowing, knowing I'm going to want to curse him. Man, learn your Bible. I can remember when I was single. I memorized more scripture when I was single than tragically. And this this shouldn't be how it is than married. I, I, I went and I found people and I said, will you teach me? Like, I was the guy who became a believer in Christ, and I literally, I didn't have any friends. Fact. Uh, I didn't have a motorcycle yet. Then I was going to get friends, right? (laughs) But, like, I'd go to service Sunday, Monday night. I was at a Christ-centered recovery thing. Tuesday night, I was at a young adult Bible study. Wednesday night, I went to this class called Equip Disciple where they taught me how to read and learn my Bible. Thursday night, I was in community group. 
right? And then, like, Monday, I'd go back and forth between that and, like, apologetic questions. First one I ever wrestled with. I trusted Christ while reading my Bible on a Saturday morning in the book of Titus. That next Monday, I was at a group, and I literally looked at these facilitators, and I said, there's no way this book is true. It's been corrupted by men. It's not holy, but yeah, is it good wisdom? And they were so merciful. Use your singleness to go all in. Not on church programs, but on getting to know the creator of the universe. Best thing you'll ever do. Guarantee it. The second way you could steward your singleness and the beauty of it, ooh, foster Foster, which means develop, don't don't expect perfection, progress. Foster spiritual disciplines. Learn what it looks like to wake up early and to start your day before the word with prayer, reading, meditation. Learn what it's like to discipline yourself, to have a pace of life where you are not marked by frantic, anxiety, and stress to where you slow down. Learn what it's like to worship God through Sabbath. You know what Sabbath should be? You know, biblically, best explanation on the planet for it. It's like a mini vacation every week. Go do that. If you want to steward the beauty of singleness, learn your Bible. Foster spiritual discipline. Third, live on mission. I can remember I was single, I didn't have any friends, and I needed to learn how to share my faith. So I would literally, I'd hang out with homeless people, and then I made some friends that were not homeless, but then I still did not know how to share my faith, tell people about Jesus. I wanted to, but I was terrified of it. Literally, my first exercise for evangelism, I just practiced small talk with strangers for 30 days. I gave myself permission to never say anything spiritual. I just had to talk to people because I know I might emote extrovert, You can ask my family, I'm far more introverted than what I present. But I, in order to figure it out, because there was a class where they would teach you how to share your faith. The only thing was I had to go all the way to Ethiopia in order to get to go to the class. (laughs) All the way, literally. I had never been to Africa, never done any of that. The second thing you had to do, you had to fundraise for nine days, including travel, five and a half thousand dollars. In order to learn how to share my faith, and I'm sure somebody else would have taught me, I had to go to Africa. Okay? You can't just do that when, you got, when you're married with kids, by the way. It's not really a normative thing. And the second thing, I had to get five and a half thousand dollars. You know what I could do when I was single? Say, done. Went to Africa. I didn't have any Christian friends to, like, fundraise to or to send letters to. I did not know anybody. So I just paid for it. I just paid for it. And it gave money away to other people. Why? I have the money. You should be ridiculously generous when you're single. Ridiculously generous. I, hey, give, save, live. I'm down for all of that. Give. Go. Engage. I can remember sharing my faith because I had literally... Um, me and some buddies, we just got in a car and we drove to Colorado overnight. Right before, I'd bought a snowboard, I'd bought skis or a helmet, all that stuff. Why? Because I could, right? Because I could. Drove all night, got to Colorado, we're sitting there. And me and some single friends, it was all singles, we, we slept in a forerunner from like 2.30 to 6.30 a.m. It was like literally zero degrees, froze to death. It was awesome. And we made a stance. We said, okay, anytime we get on the chairlift, we're not going to be weirdos. But if someone's there that's not with us, we're going to try to share our faith. Best ski trip ever. My first time out of the gate, it was so awkward. I almost like apologized to the guy. I was normal, but man, I just fumbled through it. And you know what I think God felt? That's my boy. Go skiing. I must have spent 1,500 bucks, I bet. 15? Loved every ounce of it. Live on mission. You tell somebody at HEB, you go sign up to be a buddy or a a discipleship partner with young lives. You give up extra time. Don't waste it. Fourth, develop self-control. Develop self-control. 
self-control. You want to see the beauty of singleness? You learn to steward self-control. Marriage is full of people with problems. Many of those problems are there because they were not dealt with when they were single. The most easily targeted one here is like the issue of lust, where you think, well, if I just get married, they won't have an issue with lust. This is true that males can believe this lie. This is true females can believe this lie. No, 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 no. You're going to get married and wrestle with lust. You're going to get married and have multiple times where you pray before God, Lord, I'm asking you out of love, service, sacrifice to family to take away every ounce of my sex drive for this season. That's coming. You learn that single. Don't waste an ounce of learning self-control with how, how you find identity by buying on Amazon. You kill it now. Fifth thing, fifth thing, and then we'll recap them. Fifth thing you should do, deal with your baggage. If you're a human, okay, you have baggage. If you have the world's greatest parents, you have baggage. If you have the world's worst parents, you have baggage. If you want to steward your singleness, and especially if you hold out a desire for marriage, one of the greatest acts of honor you could ever give them is you at least begin to deal with it. For many of you, what that looks like is right now as I say that, you know you have baggage, but you don't even know how to define it. It's just like this scary black hole in your life. The Holy Spirit will lead you in wrapping your arms around it and then allowing Christ to redeem it. I'm not saying it's going to fix everything, but I'm saying deal with baggage. Sixth thing, six that's kind of been baked into it. All these others I could like chapter verse. This one, it's more of a lifestyle. Go on adventures. Like single folks that you come and you engage and they're like, man, I, I should do something really fun. Like I should get out there. I, sh I should travel this summer and like get in a car or go to a third world country or maybe go live in Africa or Indonesia or hey, I'm going to partner with a buddy or hey, I'm going to do something really fun. I'm going to jump out of a plane. Okay, what are you waiting for? You should go. You should do it. If it's not sin, go do it. You get what I'm saying? But then some people are like, but it doesn't seem responsible. If you're bored, you're probably a boring person. No one wants to marry a boring person, okay? So at least go get a couple cool memories and stories. You get what I'm saying? Like, that's just a fact. Go on an adventure. Do something fun. And you can go skiing or you can go to a museum. Whatever you want. You do you. But don't waste it. There's beauty in singleness. Christ gives it dignity. So what are some ways you could steward this season? One, learn your Bible. Two, foster spiritual discipline. Three, live on mission. Four, develop self-control. Five, deal with your baggage. Six, go on adventures. Hey, pro tip, marry people. How should you steward your marriage? How should you steward this time? Learn your Bible. You learn your Bible. You develop spiritual disciplines. You meet with God. You fall in love with him. You lead a family in it. You live on mission. You give money away. You go and you care for the homeless. You serve the least of these. You go to Africa, but maybe sometimes you got to wait till kids are a certain age. And if you can't go, you give them money and they go. You develop self-control. You tame your temper. Your materialism is not tolerated. Your selfishness is not cool. Deal with your baggage. Go on adventures. Here's the trick to avoid midlife crises. Take your family on the adventures, okay? <laughs> You don't get to just have like boys weekend and like, oh, pastor said I get to play golf whenever I want. No. <laughs> you die for your family. But okay, one more thing too. Families, 
Wives, if that man will die for you and he disciplines himself towards that and you see that, you honor him. You let him go. Let him play golf. That really is a big thing in the church. Two big errors. Husbands that won't die, you're a fool and I rebuke you. And then wives that when they start to, they come with critique. And then they, without ever physically castrating, they spiritually castrate. Don't go either way. Let me read the final section and we'll close here. Verse 13, then children were brought to him. So what has Jesus done? He talked about marriage, divorce. Then he came and he talked about singleness. And now all of a sudden the scene's shifting. The Pharisees were there. Then it was the disciples. Now there are these parents bringing kids to him. Then the children were brought to him that he might lay his hands on them and pray. The disciples rebuked the people. But Jesus said, if you reference this in the gospel of Mark, Jesus, it describes his attitude as he did this. As he addresses his disciples, his attitude was indignant. Indignant carries this tone of like, how dare you? How dare you? Jesus said, let the little children come to me. Don't hinder them. For to such belong the kingdom of heaven. And he lays hands on them and went away. Sometimes when you read it, you might think, why all of a sudden now are we talking about kids? Here's why. Kids had zero social status in this culture. They didn't have dignity. They were subhuman. They were overlooked. They were, in many ways, a commodity until they could go from kid stage to marriage stage. There's a reason that the disciples, is they're bringing them to him, because they would have come, and, and Jews were commanded in the Talmud, hey, go, ask a rabbi to pray and bless, and Jesus would literally lay his hands on them and bless them. And the disciples are saying, get out of here. Why? To the disciples, kids were a waste of time. Kids were the marginalized. Kids were the weak. Kids were the overlooked. Why do you think in this interaction Christ is there and the Holy Spirit and the authorship through Matthew, he puts it here. Jesus has come and he has talked about marriage. And inside of marriage, he has talked about beauty and suffering. You ever feel overlooked? You ever feel in your marriage marginalized? Not cared for or forsaken by the other? He goes from marriage to then he talks about divorce. Man, talk about like a stigma. Do you ever feel if divorce is a part of your story, you can't tell somebody? That he calls you to have integrity, which means you be who you are, but have integrity until that moment, and then you stop. Do you think at times the divorced, the divorcee, the betrayer, the betrayed, can feel overlooked, can feel marginalized? Singles, the forgotten, the subset, the less than human, the one that though Christ gave dignity to, the culture would say, you're just not enough. Do you think they ever felt marginalized, overlooked, or forgotten? Christ in this moment is using the narrative to show the Pharisees leaving. The self-righteous, you're not going to make it. But the children, the least of these, the ones who know I don't have anything I can offer. All I can give you, Christ, is my baggage, my shame, my brokenness and my dysfunction. I'm coming to you and literally all I got is you got to lay hands on me. I need your touch. I need the blessing. I need the hope. If I don't have you, I got nothing. And then right here, he's literally, his disciples are saying, I don't have time for the marginalized. He's saying, no, 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 I'm here for the marginalized. I'm here for the broken. I'm here for the sinner. I'm here for the ones shrouded in scars. They're mine. They'll get it, they'll understand, and then they'll go. And for the sake of the kingdom, they'll live. Whoever you are, wherever you are, he loves you. Folks might tell you, you have to go away. Christ bids you come near. You can find healing 
through relationship with him. And it's not a relationship where he does it from a distance and says, hope you get better with time. He comes and he lays hands. This is the greatest news ever told. He loves you. Married, single, divorced, kid, forgotten, overlooked, stuck in sin, fighting sin. He can change everything. Let me pray. Lord, I thank you for just the truth of your word. How it's amazing how, Holy Spirit, you even wrote, constrict, and combine all this narrative together. You are amazing. I thank you for such a gift as this. We love you. It's in your name we pray. Amen.